But I think the one thing that we're very weak in in the United States is training the civilians. We, as a civilian population, uh, uh, want to think it's not our responsibility to get involved. Uh, the government will handle it, or the first responder will handle it. Uh, you look at uh, active shooters uh, as they are today, and I don't hold me to this number, but I think 70% of them are over before the first law enforcement officer shows up. So that means you're going to be responsible, you yourself are responsible for surviving and getting through this issue before the law enforcement gets there. Um, and I think uh, the Israelis seem to have, that's the difference between us and Israel, their civilian population is prepared and understands terrorism and violence uh, in America, not so much. Let me, let me just add to the commissioner, and I, I think he's right. Um, when you sit out there, he may be looking at this panel and saying, okay, those are the guys that have got to do this stuff. But all of us in the room needs to take a part of this. So we were talking active shooters. Well, there's a campaign right now within the United States of stopping the bleeding. And we need to make sure that, that every school kid knows how to do that. We need to make sure that, that in every high-rise building we have fire drills. It's required by law. But what about we also throw a 30-second video on to our, our, our people in these buildings on how to stop the bleeding. And what about it next to a fire extinguisher and the, uh, the uh, AEDs, the uh, automatic uh, defibrillators that we have? Why not, why not throw some tourniquets there? doesn't cost a lot of money. But now it becomes all our responsibilities. Because as the commissioner said, by the time the first responder gets there, well, minutes passed. So, so look, at, look at it this way. If we have an, an active shooter, certainly what we, what we saw in Las Vegas, if that takes place from the moment someone gets shot and their, their neighbor within an office can, can apply direct pressure and stop the bleeding. That starts to buy time. First responders come, and there's two missions. And this is becoming more and more popular, and, and certainly we want you to take this back. There's two missions that occur. One is by law enforcement, and their job is to stop the dying, to stop the killing. So to, to neutralize the shooter, to stop them from continuing to kill. But as the fire department comes in, the FDNY comes in without medical resources, the second mission is to stop the dying. And that starts with the first person that's stopping the bleeding. A medical person will come in, and we, we continue that stopping the dying, and that continues all the way to the hospitals. So it's, it's the entire spectrum of care from a co-worker to the first responders, all the way into the operating room of the hospital. So that, 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 that phrase of stopping the killing and stopping the dying, we're all part of that, and we have a responsibility to take up those individual <coughs> missions to, to help and save a life. Sure, and, and to follow up that, um, in, in dealing with the idea that the average citizen should should know some things and be prepared. Um, apart from you know having tourniquets and, and, and possibly knowing first aid, are there a few things that, that everyone, say in this audience, should know or should know how to do, uh, just in, in today's world? You asked that question just like I wrote it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so at the at the state, we have a video called 480 seconds, based on the amount of time uh, it is. Be, that you have to make yourself survive. So there's, the federal government did a lot of work on something called run, hide, fight, based on uh, stop, drop, roll that we all learned. And uh, you need to, uh, I implore you to go take a look at this one that was done by my department. There's other ones done by other departments are a little bit more graphic, but I think mine is a great introductory film. And uh, you, you need to understand to survive something like this, you don't necessarily mean to run. Run means get a distance 
from the perpetrator. Make it distance. The more distance you have from the person either shooting or stabbing, the better chance of survival you have. The more time you buy, the more time you get past 480 seconds, the better chance you have to survive. And you have, you be able to uh, have the first responder show up and then the medical personnel will come in behind it. So uh, you need, we, and the uh, chief was talking about your, your office partner putting on the tourniquet. You need to learn how to put on the tourniquet that you have that, for your injury so that you're taking care of yourself instead of depending upon somebody else. That's where we need to go. Sure. Um, and then coming back to um, you know, what, what our law enforcement officials uh, need to be doing or, or are doing, um, oftentimes when there is any kind of attack or incident, the press immediately reports on, you know, was this person on the radar of law enforcement? Were they, were they monitored? You know, were there warning signs? Did we, did we miss something? On that front, how well are we doing as a country, as a state in New York, uh, as a city, uh, in identifying, assessing, and, and responding um, to potential threats and then persons? Yeah. I'll, I'll, jump on, I'll jump off on that. Uh, the, this isn't a uniquely American issue. Uh, if you remember the Paris nightclub shooting, those individuals will, were also known to law enforcement within France and in Interpol. In the situations we've seen in the United States, the most uh, publicly known and spectacular attacks, there was also information that was known to law enforcement. But the issue is, if they have not committed a crime in a free democratic society, then you, you can't charge or hold them. That's not the country we live in. This is not uh, you know, Saddam's Iraq, uh, and that's a good thing. So we have to find a balance. Uh, the Israelis, that it, it's a very different and good model for their country. We need to come up with a, a good model for our country where we are balancing the rights of the individual with the needs of a society not to live in perpetual fear. Uh, and having worked with uh, some colleagues in Israel many years ago during the Intifada, I can tell you that I don't ever want to live in a country or a city where you have to fear getting on a bus because it might blow up. Uh, and if, if Americans don't think that that's potential here, that's a real problem. So we need to, law enforcement needs to not only have the political backing from their government uh, to go in and do the hard work sometimes and to take uh, measures uh, in investigations that are not always popular in order to prevent the loss of life. I mean, there's no more primary responsibility, fundamental responsibility of government than to protect life and, and property. So uh, I believe that we are, we are coming to an age where, uh, and we had sort of this notion after 9-11, where we can't afford this kind of a catastrophic attack and this kind of a uh, an attack on our liberties in the society, we need to take extraordinary measures. We've lapsed from that. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. I lived in Washington, D.C., in the surrounding area during the D.C. sniper uh, episode. And, and that was you know, two individuals driving around in a car with a rifle, and it paralyzed the entire Capitol area. You went to the gas station to fill up, and you were hiding behind you know, the gas pumps because you're afraid that there's going to be somebody driving by and shooting at you. Uh, that kind of, in, in a free society like the United States, that is crippling. That is crippling. And, and those are the kinds of things that I, we need to give the tools to law enforcement, to the, the, the federal government, and we as legislators and leaders need to be willing to take some political shots in order to protect life. 